Okay, hello everybody. Uh, today we are going to speak about early perceptual and cognitive development. And um, so we'll speak about um, uh, how different sensory mechanisms emerge, especially uh, you know the ones that appear early and the ones that we uh, that we rely on um, you know basic on, on you know to do basic stuff. So first, the, the first sense to develop is touch. And that develops prenatally. So for example, in by age, by, by week um, eight of um, gestation during pregnancy, um, the, the many parts of the body of the fetus are able to feel to to you know the sense of touch, and the nerve endings spread to cover the entire body by about age fourteen. Uh, I mean week fourteen in gestation. So that is the the earliest uh, sense again to be uh, to be present. In terms of hearing, hearing is the next one. <clears throat> the next sense. It starts to develop in gestation um, around week eight. And then by week 21, or week 20 actually, the end of week 21, then the outer ear, and I mean, in terms of the, the I'm, I'm sorry, the middle ear and the inner ear. So the middle ear and the inner ear reach basically um, uh, reach adult size. I mean, basically. And they are able to function. Just to give you an idea how big the cochlea is, it's the size of a chickpea. If you eat hummus, a chickpea is one grain that, um, or the size of a, you know, a green pea, if you, if you would. So from that point on, the baby, the fetus is able to hear, and they spend about four months, you know, being able to hear and being able to expose to the mother's voice. And as a result, they are able to detect the intonation. Intonation means the rhythm of speech. As we speak, we continuously raise our pitch, lower our pitch, raise our loudness, lower our loudness, and we create that speech melody. So that speech melody or intonation provides the first tool for the baby, for the fetus to acquire, to learn uh, the basics of the language. And every language has its own rhythm. Every language has its own melody or intonation. So as a result, the baby in a matter of weeks, I mean the fetus before the fetus is born, is able to distinguish the native language of the mother from another language. The, the fetus is able to distinguish the mother's voice from another voice and is able to, um, um, to distinguish some, some kind of basically uh, human speech from noises or, or, or other kinds of uh, sounds. However, you know, this is a mechanism that is part of the peripheral uh, auditory system. That means the central auditory system, it has to do with the cortex and, you know, the, the top area of the brain. And that is what is able to translate the sounds that you hear into linguistic meaning to, to enable you to understand and recognize and so on. And, and to determine what should I use this sound for? I now I hear a sound of a car. What should I use it for? Should I, maybe I am walking uh, on the street where I am not supposed to be walking. So I should use that information to alert me so I can move out of the way. So, or someone is calling me, that is human speech. And all of these um, things um, of pro that require the processing and converting the signals into linguistic meaning then that is in the central auditory system, which is the part of the cortex that is specialized in 
converting signals into uh, kind of combining different sounds into words and syllables and then giving you the meaning of what you are hearing. So the auditory cortex is not mature yet. At that time, we know when you read the article, hopefully you have already, uh, of the auditory cortex maturation, you will notice that initially the very top layer of the gray matter begins to kind of, you know, show signs, you know, of these neurons uh, out there, the body of the bodies of the neurons. They are on the very top layer. And then they start gradually, um, stage by stage, to extend their axons down. As the axons extend down, then you, they are going to, to, to eventually, by age 11 years or, or 12 years, 11 to 12, they are going to reach down and they are going to connect with uh, you know, lower parts of the brain or the brain stem and lower parts of the brain. And now the person is able, um, you know, basically by that age, they would acquire language and their language equals that of an adult in terms of development. They have acquired all the content of the language, all the form, you know, components of the language and their language on a basic level is like the adult's language. Perception is the second step after sensation. So sensing something in the environment, say for example, you, um, you kind of hold something and manipulate it so that it can touch your fingertips and the fingertips have sensory mechanisms that can actually read and identify objects that you are holding like you can find your key in the dark by simply feeling but if it doesn't touch if it doesn't uh, touch your fingertips and 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 for example your thumb then um, you're not going to be able to read it because there are no centers here so having the any kind of information like if you touch hold something like that is information what can I get out of this? I can get the texture. Uh, I can get um, to see if it is uh, smooth, if it is, um, uh, I mean, if it is rubbery, if it is hot, cold, everything that, ha the shape of it, geometric, geometry of it, all of this is information that my fingertips read and then they send to the brain. Once they reach the brain, then um, the information is taken identified, integrated into existing information. And then we kind of use that information as a foundation for cognition. So sensation, perception, and cognition. So perception is using sensory information and previous knowledge to gather and make sense of information or stimuli that are registered by the senses. So registered by the senses means they come in contact with the senses. Like I see something, now when I, my eye um, actually locates it, that, is, uh, that will be um, registration of the information or sensory, sensory registration. My ears, when, um, when a sound, um, an acoustic wave that carries you know, a sound hits my eardrum, then and starts to, to go through, then that is registering it auditorily. So again, that sensory experience or sensory information we get, as it goes to the brain, the brain kind of processes it and integrates it with our existing information and it interprets interprets the meaning of that sensory information. For example, I hear the sounds, mm, I, k, that is mic. So when the sounds get to the auditory cortex in the, in the brain, the top surface of the brain, they come as individual sounds and then they are connected together into a syllable. And then you get, there are systems that actually get the meaning. All of this then, that is perception. 
once you store the information and then it, it gets integrated into all older memory or uh, older um, knowledge, previous knowledge, then that becomes part of your cognition. It becomes something that you know. I wanted to point out before we move on, um, I wanted to point out that perception is the same, in, in a way, similar to sensory registering. Both of them are different from person to person to person. My sensory experience, when I look at something, we can look at the same apple, but you might see it more vibrant, you might see it bigger or smaller, you might see it uh, more faint. Based on your visual acuity, uh, you are going to see it in a, in a certain way. So, or words, you know, I might have a hearing loss, or I might have a history of middle ear infections and stuff that made my mechanism not function perfectly like it, it, it would. So based on how your hearing is or your vision is and all of these levels, that is going to shape what kind of sensory experience you are going to get. Now that sensory experience, when it goes to the brain, it is going to be interpreted with reference to your background, to the information you already have. And that information is gonna say, what is coming in? Do I recognize this? Is there anything similar to this? So you might not have say, or you might, someone might have wrong information. So they take that sensory experience coming in and they are going to interpret it in a whole different way. So like say, someone has a, a certain experience, they are afraid of snakes and they just freeze when they see something like this and, and they're walking somewhere and they look down and they see a little piece of a rope and imagine what that is going to do to them. So they could just run away or something because they perceived it based on a certain experience they have, certain information they have in their emotional system and their cognitive system and they interpreted what they saw in a whole different way than what you would, how you would interpret it. So the idea is Perceptual means it changes from person to person. And the same sensory, it shapes the perception, but also it, um, uh, the, the background knowledge that you have, how accurate it is, how extensive it is, it is going to shape your perception of things. And, and also the acuity of your sensory mechanisms will also shape your perception. So perception is something that is very, uh, that is variable and um, it changes from, I mean, different from person to person. The, there are many reports that show a baby, a newborn just coming out, you know, to life and, and you know, smiling. But of course, um, there are also some exaggerated stories this baby might be in the middle of crying or maybe, um, you know, kind of, um, what do you call it, um, burping or whatever facial expression. But it, what matters is that the baby, when the baby is born immediately, is able to make eye contact. Yes, their visual um, ability is they see in fuzzy, like almost like foggy images. And the, the acuity is best about seven and a half or eight inches to 12 inches, which is the top segment of the arm. So when you hold the baby like that, this from here to here, you know, from the face of the baby to your, to your, um, uh, to your mouth. So then the baby at that time can recognize the mother's voice um, in a few days and the baby very soon will be able to discriminate among, among different facial expressions. And they're actually very, very tuned to faces at that time, like say six weeks, if they see a face, they tend to kind of, once they learn the social smile as actually three weeks, they start to, to smile. If you get a balloon and put two dots on it, 
that looks like an you know eyes like a face and you show it to a baby who's like two months or three months old they they might smile they might they're gonna see it as a human face and they are so focused and fascinated by human faces so the ability to distinguish um, various faces uh, of, I mean, three months, I bet if they test it earlier than that, they will find that they, uh, babies can distinguish them earlier. At three months, a baby is able to tell uh, the, the racial differences among people. Like if they see a black person and a white person, they know that these two faces are different. They are not the same. Um, but it doesn't mean that they assign that they say this one is more you know superior to that one or this one is better no babies don't do that and and even until six years of age so four to six months they um, respond positively to you when you smile and of course that's a great social um social language uh, when they exchange so you smile at them and they they are going to smile back or to wiggle or do something and that is a language that they use for playing smiling and smiling back and and cooing and so on five to eight months they are able to recognize their own face when they look in the mirror and that is important because that is going to be the beginning of what we call theory of mind being able to read other people's minds. And they'll speak more about this in a few minutes. So now, so that what we spoke about was, um, you know, various, you know, steps and, and development. Now we'll go back again from first month to second month and see the characteristics. How exactly do they get attracted by different things how do they scan and, and stuff like that so two one month four weeks to eight weeks the the baby is um shows when they showed them some image like this or a scene they look at they're attracted by the edges of the scene the periphery of the scene and they don't focus necessarily on the on the core on the the biggest idea of of the image that is there when as adults when we see a human face i mean yeah a human, because other animals also have faces when you see a human face and doesn't matter how old you are but when you look at the human face the first thing that you do is your eyes go around the circumference of the face they just take a quick tour of the circumference it's like taking a visual map and registering it knowing your dimensions like is your face long and narrow is it you know rounded and wider is it you know all of this the dimensions you take them and just store them like exactly like you store the space where you are going to park your car you get the dimensions and you have stored the dimensions of your car and you can tell if your car with that these dimensions is going to fit into that space or not so then the second thing that we do when we look at someone's face we immediately start to go around look at the eyes these are very very important we look at the eyes to read is this person a, a foe is this person a friend and then we look at the mouth what are they going to say to us eyes mouth eyes mouth but the circumference the person might go might be once more but generally just they start with the circumference and then they go uh, watch eyes mouth eyes mouth so the baby at that time is not able to focus like that so they just look at the boundaries of of things they are attracted to them more um then the baby can can do vertical scanning can can scan up and down and can scan horizontally you know laterally uh, left and right um, again and within eight weeks they can converge their eyes onto one target and can adjust their vision field of vision and they can also diverge eyes they can see a full range of colors 
by about four months because the colors there are in the retina there are cells called rods and cones and they are in a connect just like how you have a pattern of christmas lights and connect you know in a certain way so they connect um, as they the baby sees light and is exposed to light um, frequently these rods and cones then get stimulated and they combine and they connect and they make quite a rich fabric and they will be able then to see basically all the full range of colors by four months so by the third month the baby is able to do eye hand coordination that is important because the baby now is going to take things and place that you know that in, in the baby in his or her mouth they are able to you know touch tell me touch your nose do this do that i mean they can do things and and that that is important because they will be reaching for things and putting them in their mouths and so on they would be interested in holding things and manipulating them means touching them and, and holding them and throwing them to see what the effect is going to be when they throw something what noise it will make and and so on so a purposeful manipulation if they, you give them like a bear or or a block or a, a little ball or something that they hold and these give rise to the first concepts that the baby is going to learn so the first thing that the basic concepts that they will acquire first are hard soft heavy light round square these are the earliest concepts of course they will not be able to say them or but they have the in their sensory mechanisms they can distinguish something that is square from something that is round uh, something that is light something that is heavy and something that is soft or something that is hard they will have the words for these afterwards when they learn how to um, you know when they hear and and they're able to to speak after the baby is able um, when the baby is able to recognize sound uh, faces familiar faces and also recognize sounds and objects that is going to lead to the ability to recall these things because how do you recognize it, something that you have already seen before and then you have stored it here and then when you see it again you match the image of it in your brain with the incoming image and say oh i recognize that i know it and that is again is going to be the source the foundation that will give rise to recalling things for example, um, um, the baby, uh, when the, the, the baby hears the mother's footsteps and, and the mother's out of, of the room, the baby now is able to remember, oh, I make the association that these footsteps belong to my mother. And that is recall, that's intentional recall. Seeing a bottle, the baby sees a, a bottle is going to remember that food is going to be coming out of this this bottle so the baby begins to make associations between sound you know sounds and the and the thing that that is made by these sounds or uh, that makes these sounds uh sights and smell and texture and so all of these associations are going to be made um before before eight months so by eight months the baby is able to recall words like you say something doggy a uh, cat this that the baby then will be able to recall them they can't say but when you, when you show them like say uh, a cat and a, and, a, and a dog and you say dog they are going to, to look at the dog for example recognize it so in terms of auditory development we think now we spoke about sensory auditory development now we speak about perceptual the meaning of things and and how sounds are manipulated in the 
cerebral cortex and the auditory cortex. So the baby, the system, the whole auditory system, like anything else, is going to develop through experience. Experience means hearing sounds. So that is an audit, kind of auditory experience. Every time a sound comes in, it creates firing that continues, you know, from one segment to another segment to another to go to the brain. So the firing begins in the cochlea, in the inner ear, and then from there, it goes finally to the cerebral cortex, the, audit, the, the part of the cerebral cortex that we know as the auditory cortex, right above the ears. So as the person hears the same sound again, then you start to specialize and have networks. You know, that same initial um, set of neurons that, that heard the signal and fired it, they are going to fire again. And every time they fire again, they connect better. They, they integrate, you know, their information better. Every time, as you continue stimulating them by sound, so a child, when the child hears rich language in the environment, a lot of nice voices singing and reading and rhyming and all of this, that is a very rich environment. That is definitely going to enhance the connectivity of the auditory pathways of the baby and is going to connect the ears well, you know, better with the pathways and with the brain. And then the baby, um, the channel will be open and there will be no problem with comprehension. But put middle ear infections, that's going to throw off this equation. Put in some hearing loss uh, or any kind of abnormality and along the way that could interrupt the signals and then that is going to create very, very, um, uh, it, it could create serious, serious consequences for language learning, for cognition development, and all of the other things. So we said that the baby is able to recognize the mother's voice before birth. The baby is able to recognize the, the language of the mother before being born. At birth, the baby is able to discriminate the mother's voice and will tilt, the, I mean, uh, the eyes in the direction of the mother's voice. And again, they would recognize language of, of the mother or, or their language uh, compared to another language. By two months, the baby is able to differentiate between one pitch and another, like different pitches and frequencies, you know, something that is high pitch, low pitch, and also um, by about seven months or so, they now have mastered intonation patterns of the language, the rhythms of the language. For example, intonation, intonation patterns, like you could say um, a statement, you live in uh, Franklin. You live in Franklin. So as a matter of fact, like I'm saying it as a statement, I know that you live in Franklin. So, but I could say the same statement with a different intonation and that will make it a question. So instead of saying you live in Franklin, I say you live in Franklin? And with that different kind of intonation, now you understand I am asking a question. But I mean, not even just asking a question, I'm expressing, expressing surprise. I am asking a question and very surprised about the possibility that you live in Franklin, for example, or you live in Franklin. I wanted confirmation, so I'm asking a question. So the intonation of the language is going to tell you the intent. I could say the same statement, uh, try making a joke with my, you know, changing the intonation to make a joke, to be sarcastic, to make a, you know, a basic statement, to ask a question. That's an, a very, very important uh, part of the language. I say often to my students that intonation colors the words that you say with your emotions. So when you say something, you bring it to life, you color it with your emotions, with your, in the way that you make it give a certain intonation.
so it it, it reveals the meaning <clears throat> by seven months the baby has mastered the intonation of the native language and has mastered the sound system of the native language seven months and there is a window of time like until 11 months where the baby can differentiate um, the different phonemes of the of the one language his or her language and also can differentiate the phonemes of any other language would be able to just give them any other language and they can distinguish between one sound and the other so like they are universal learners at that time but once they pass that critical stage they reach 11 months now they don't have that ability and they only distinguish among the sounds and phonemes of their native language <clears throat> and they are going to start to perceive look at a foreign language when they hear it as just noise they ignore it they, they just because the networks now have been dedicated to that you know native language and that means that they are not going to have much energy to focus on another one of course you can teach <coughs> babies uh, you can teach them even five languages you know when they are one year two year three year old um, but there has to be consistency and there have to be <coughs> native speakers who would interact with them and all of this but like i said the na the basic basic repertoire of sounds is mastered by 11 months of age and the person will start the flexibility of the brain plasticity in terms of language uh, is still there five years and then it continues roughly you know decreasing a bit until you reach puberty our age 15 15 then this is where the the person will have a tough time and they could master the language in every way but they will continue to speak with an accent so that's the auditory system i just put it there so that what i mentioned before is that the middle ear like the the ossicles in the middle ear and the inner ear here these reach adult size by the end of week 20 um in uh, during pregnancy so the signal you know comes in <clears throat> and then gets into the ear canal and the ear canal amplifies it because of the shape and certain mechanisms make the signal louder and then it hits the signal shakes or vibrates the eardrum in the same way like the wave comes the wave goes bang 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 like this compress go back compress go back and the eardrum will do the same go you know will be pushed in will bounce back and again out again so it mimics the sound wave that comes in and then the this um uh stapes you know is is connected with the inner ear and there's fluid inside there's a tunnel and fluid and the stapes gets pushed this the sound makes it go in to the oval window and out in and out it, it repeats the same pattern of the wave that originally came and then the fluid is going up and down up and down in the cochlea and that also the water going up and down it mimics the wave so then finally there are mechanisms called hair cells in the cochlea lining up the entire cochlea and specialized in detecting particular you know every single frequency that we have there so the cochlea has about 16 and a half 16,500 hair cells or roughly 16,000 and lined up in a very certain way you know specialized and the cochlea these you know hair hair cells in the cochlea can amplify the sound to make it louder and then based on how much you need how loud it and then the signal then is fired to through the auditory nerve and from there it goes to the higher levels of the you know the brain stem first where it, it recognizes the location of the sound and it muffles noises and and it kind of makes the the signal more fine-tuned 
and finally then it goes to the cerebral cortex which also has the ability to say you know the signals you are sending are weak could you amplify and all of this so we'll study it uh, we'll study this a little bit more when we speak about auditory um you know the auditory system and and language later but uh, this is just like a, a quick introduction and then finally and the brain the, the the signal becomes kind of interpreted So, again, you know, like I mentioned, um, by the time that the baby, uh, I mean, pregnancy is eight weeks, I mean, um, I'm sorry, 20 weeks, then the baby is able to hear uh, sounds. And um, they, after, when they are born, uh, they start to dis differentiate sounds and so on from each other. And then by 11 months, then they have that ability to distinguish among different languages and, and different sounds uh, of, of, of different languages. Then it, it starts to go away. The, the implications for this is foreign language, you know, if someone wants to have a child who is a true bilingual, they should start from birth. If the mother, the mother can speak as, you know, her own language, the father can speak the language, or if both of them are, they can be the source of that native language. And then the child is going to be exposed to English uh, in many, many ways through the society, the you know, TV and all of this. So it should start earlier. Um, the other thing too, with that acuity in sound discrimination, that means that the baby is going to detect the smallest variations in your tone of voice as a parent. And the baby is going to internalize, the baby is going to learn. Is this a, you know, a happy tone? Is it a sad? Is it neutral? Is uh, my mother happy to be with me to interact? Does she care? Does she not? The baby is able to take cues from your intonation and to be able to read your emotional state because they are dependent on you. And they watch this, you know, for this extremely, extremely um, carefully. So once the baby is able to detect different sound patterns, like intonation rising and going up and going down or loudness and all of this, that is going to give rise. The arrow here means like a chemical equation, the arrow it yields or it, it gives rise to whenever you see it in, in my lectures. So all the ability to detect sound patterns gives rise to the formation of concepts basic concepts like um for example uh, you know the, the words like soft uh, w w or saying hi or uh, you know basic words that the baby uh, hears every day so these are concepts that start you know the baby will be able then to start to formulate so by the end of the seventh month um Basically, language preference um, is established, but there is a window of time between 7 and 11 where the baby still has the ability to distinguish between um, uh, among the sounds of a foreign language, but after that, they lose that ability. The baby is able to respond to his or her own name by five months. Of course, you might say, oh, my, my child started earlier, but this is an average. Maybe there are kids, uh, babies that can start maybe three and a half months, and babies then that might start six and a half months, but this, this is just an average. And these averages are not based on American children. They are based on universal all over the world. Um, so the child's you know, perceptual skills, sound, you know, in relation to recognizing speech and all of this at six months, these abilities at six months, they determine how the child's um, ability, language ability is going to be shaped. 
they that will that will influence and will determine if the baby is able to understand words if the baby is going to be able to produce words and phrases uh, for example and understand them you would say well i we can say understand but how does affect how does that affect speech in terms of speech in terms of speech in order to produce speech you have to hear sounds and hear them long enough until you build these networks and you you build sound representations phonological representations of the sounds that you hear you internalize that and that becomes the blueprint that will be sent to the motor system that is going to the motor cortex that is going to move your lips and your larynx and all the muscles of of speech that you are going to use with if the person doesn't have mature and well developed networks that you know for, uh, for speech perception there they will not be able to produce normal speech and the speech problem is going to depend on the severity of the perceptual problem so it is basically if you don't have it in your brain how on earth can you give it and we always have to build stronger perceptual skills than what we can give because no matter how much we try we can't externalize everything that we we have inside of us so so again i want to emphasize the importance we are speaking about six months when we do studies and look at you know say for example a baby start to coo when they start to coo making these vowel sounds that is the development of the vowel sound production between two and four months and between four and six months the baby's babbling it means the baby is producing a syllable one complete syllable like ma ta da and then eight to actually six to eight months the baby now is able to produce two combined two syllables maybe ta ta da da ma ma so and they practice and practice with the with these sounds that we call babbling but that all is a is a reflection of what they have here and we can detect at age four or at age six months if the baby based on the quality of the babbling and the frequency of the babbling we can detect detect if that baby is being stimulated enough if that baby is going to develop you know uh, language in, in a typical way or or an atypical way based on how much stimulation auditory stimulation they are having so it is really really critical from birth to 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 expose the the child to sounds to to interact with the child to speak and and you know do these little um you know rhymes and do um what what is known as parentese or previously called motherese way of speech uh you know and there's a system to it but continuous interaction with the baby in one way or another positive interactions that are enjoyable that will encourage the baby to communicate the more you communicate with the baby the more the baby wants to communicate and the danger here is if a mother has or a caregiver has depression that is going to have a big impact on the baby and how the baby will develop communication skills studies show that if you interact with the baby the baby immediately is going to respond and if you withdraw and not interact as much the baby is going to you know be less likely to even interact but if the baby the baby actually initiates in many cases the baby can initiate communication with you by wiggling or smiling or making noises when the baby sees you not responding well the first they will be very upset and there's a video that actually shows it uh, 
if I can locate it, I'll post it. But if the baby initiates, you know, once and you don't respond, like these little sounds they make and stuff, and then another time, and another time, and another time, and they don't get a, the response that you should give them, like they smile at you, you don't smile back, they, they coo or say a sound when they see you and you don't respond, they will learn not to respond to you later. They will learn to be withdrawn. They will learn, and please don't interpret this as I am saying that you are creating autism. No, autism is a very complex thing. It's not created by parents, no. But the baby is going to have difficulty with communication and is not going to, to, to respond to you, to be interactive. And, and all this because they try and try and there's a window of time you need to give the stimulation and then you would draw because you are depressed or you can't smile at them and all of this of course we can't help these things but awareness is going to make a difference you know you know um, there are ways and, and of course depression we know people respond very well to medications and if they have the right treatment they do extremely well and the problem is, I mean, 80%, but the 20% who regress are the ones when they go back on the medication, I mean, they have the medication and then they start feeling good and they, they kind of stop. Why do I need the medication? And then it will be like gradually going downhill, keep going, going, going. And they, no, no, I'm not going to do anything. When the person goes down, down the, the bottom of the hill, they can't bring themselves up again, and they will need serious help. We don't want this to be the situation. So awareness is the first step for prevention. So again, here's one milestone that has to be accomplished. If that milestone is not accomplished at six months, then you will see problems later and you wonder sometimes when you you know we have speech language evaluations a child comes in and they don't have any neurological impairment they don't have you know anything that we are aware no middle ear infections and all this and then you go and say oh why do they have this severe sound disorder why uh, you know they have this severe do they have this severe uh, you know, comprehension problem. It is a lot of stuff that happens early in life. And when they come to you, they don't have these problems anymore. The physical barriers aren't there, but the effect of them lasts years and years. You know, of course, again, I'm not speaking about intervention. Of course, intervention can make all the difference. And the earlier the intervention is, the better. But I'm just telling you how serious it is that... The, the, the early years, beginning from birth, you know, and, and going on, there are many critical periods. If you do not provide the stimulation in some cases, it doesn't matter afterwards. And we'll speak about this next week. That is, uh, we'll speak uh, more deeply about connectivity and how stimulation makes the nerves connect in the brain how it connects in response to stimulation, and we'll also speak about um, the critical periods. So next week is going to be quite a, I mean, you will learn so much in addition to, to this. When we say auditory pattern, we mean things that you hear consistently, words, syllables that you keep hearing, for example, when you listen to different words, you will learn that in English, there is no way that you can have more than three consonants together in any word. For example, three consonants, say as you say string, s, t, r, these are all consonants, no vowel in between. But imagine a word that has four consonants in English, there is just about basically none you might see them in spelling but that that is not you have to to say these words you have to insert a vowel somewhere for example another pattern the p and the f in english it is not acceptable it is not part of the english language and when you hear and hear 
you you understand that this doesn't exist in what I hear. So that's the pattern. When you hear um, you know different syllables, for example, uh, different sounds, they might come before or after a certain vowel all the time consistently. So the the, the basic instinctive pattern of the syllable and 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 the what a sound where a sound can occur uh, you know in a word and so on these are sound auditory patterns sound patterns and and when they are consistent the baby then uh, builds uh, you know uh, starts to form uh, these patterns and then they will be able to recognize words when they hear them so by eight months the baby begins to store sound patterns for an entire word. They are able to, to hear a whole word and store that sound pattern, the sounds, how they are sequenced in the word, how they are said in the word, and the baby can then, when they hear the same pattern or the same word, they are going to recognize it. Like you say their name or say doggy or kitty, but the meaning is not always attached. So they, they learn the sound pattern uh, first, and then the meaning, you know, might come in a day or two. Because, again, uh, you need more memory systems so that you can, you can get meaning and attach it and so on. Between eight months, oh, but I wanted to mention that, eight months, there is a spurt in synaptic connectivity in the brain. There are more neurons making more and more and more connections and in, you kind of, it's a sp speed up in, in synaptic connectivity, uh, synaptic connectivity. And that is going to prepare the child for to walk and to talk and to do more things. There's also myelination, you could imagine, it increases at that time as well. So between 8 and 11 months, the baby is able to comprehend the meaning of words. The baby, um, like I said, starts to tune out sound differences that are not present in the first language. Now, they have networks dedicated to the native language, and they don't have energy, they don't, are not interested in a foreign language that they hear once in a while. But like I said, if you now expose them to an environment, like you say, well, I, someone got a child from China, adopted a child from China, and, and now the child speaks Chinese, that means that they can't speak English. Of course they can. Uh, but, the, you know, there is a way, you know, consistency and all of this. The risk <coughs> that or, or the statement that, that the research has confirmed over and over is, in order for a person to acquire, to learn a language, that person must acquire a native language and the basics of a native language, at least during the first year, so that that child will be able to acquire another human language. Why? Because there are language universals all languages have grammar, all languages have a structure and pattern go from the sound to the word to the sentence to the paragraph and so on. All human languages have that. So if someone has difficulty acquiring their native language in the first year of life, that is going to create a situation that will make it hard for that person to acquire another language. And again, I, I, I'm a bilingual speech-language pathologist. I do lots of bilingual evaluations, and I see cases where someone, for example, will be born, uh, say, in Kuwait or in Egypt or somewhere, and then they, there were problems, uh, for example, with, um, you know, whatever communication problems, and the child didn't develop the Arabic language foundations in, you know, during the first, you know, uh, year or so. And then they come here, and then the parents are speaking to the child in English, that is broken English. And then the child um, is, is, you know, listening to, to English uh, on TV and different sources and socialization. 
and they have they go to school grade one two three and they still are not able to learn english as fast as they should and the idea is um we the, the root again you have to look back and see did they have the chance to develop their native language cognition <clears throat> now we move from perception to cognition cognition is the store of memories all the bits and pieces of memories that you captured that you captured throughout your life and stored they are all of these together embedded they make your knowledge bank and you use that knowledge bank to recognize things that are around you to 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 relate to them to interpret them to you know to perceive them and all of this so that all of this knowledge you have makes your cognition so it is based on uh, all the mental activities that are involved in comprehension comprehending uh, perceived <coughs> information <coughs> um, memory storage and the use of the knowledge that you have so it is uh, it's like cognition knowing you know the act of knowing when you um, Con, uh, cognition is like the inner knowledge that you have and again it is all formed based on all these you know representations and some are, you know memories of all the experiences you have had throughout your life any kind of experiences and then that is stored and that becomes your knowledge bank that becomes your uh, the foundation of your cognition. How does early cognitive development progress? So first, the earliest signs that the baby shows that he or she knows, for example, something, is has to do with face recognition. Because, you know, the baby is totally dependent and understands that someone who has a particular face is gonna help me maybe feed me or this person with this particular face is gonna you know uh, sing with me or do this or do that they they are fascinated by faces they are focused on faces and that's one of the earliest um, recognition abilities they acquire to acquire uh, to to be able to recognize human faces and and that ability it, the right hemisphere is more dominant in it than the left. The organization, the brain by itself, by nature, is organized based on stations and elementary areas that are like the basic stations, the engines for particular skills. For example, in the left side of the brain, only in the left side of the brain, about here, there's an area called Broca's area. That area is specialized in combining words into sentences. So, you know, syntax. And this, you know, ability, for example, is connected with, you know, other things. And there's, a whole, you know, many networks. So different areas have different specialties. And that means that the brain has to take information and sort it out and organize it in different ways so when you give me some you give me a presentation or a lecture and you mix everything together and just dump it on me my brain is going to spend so much time sorting out the information class you know putting this everything that belongs together you know in the same place and so on so um organization is very important uh, for uh, it facilitates the processing of the information it facilitates the storage of the information that we receive and um, when we do that and we have systematic patterns in the environment that is going to enable the baby to develop in a healthy way uh, it, it when you organize information 
it is going to enable uh, to, to, to prevent cognitive overload. I'll give you an example. Routines that the baby has are well-structured and well-organized kind of contexts that where the baby hears the same thing day, you know, day after day. Okay, what are the routines? Sleep time is a routine. What happens when you, sleep, you know the baby's sleep time? You have the blanket. You 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 might have like some music, or you might dim the light. You might you you create that environment that every day the baby goes to sleep, they go through the same system. Every time the baby goes to take a bath, you know you put the warm water on, and the baby and you get the towel, and you put the soap, and you put this and this and and <clears throat> that these routines are critical in enabling the child to acquire language and to acquire you know uh, also cognitive abilities because once you bring a towel or once the baby hears the water running in the bathroom now you the the, the networks in the baby's brain memory networks are going to lighten up i mean and light up and the baby now is able to imagine himself or herself inside of that bathroom and is going to imagine the things that that she sees every day that's a big big task so that organization is is really critical and routines as i mentioned are very very important uh, in enabling the child to acquire uh, cognitive and linguistic skills uh, this um, is the, what you see highlighted yellow is the limbic system that is the system that integrates three important skills. Very, very critical. And I'm highlighting that because we are speaking about uh, teaching, learning, and all of this. The th three systems that exist together and are mediated by the same system and connected so well are number one, emotional system, motivational system, the, learning, the, the memory and learning system, memory processing system. So the three, motivation, emotions, now obviously linked. And then these two shape how we are going to remember, how we are going to forget. So, so here, this little area the, that is, they say sometimes looking like a, a hippocampus, like a seahorse, that is the hippocampus. It is named from Phoenician, old Syrian language, um, uh, you know, they would call a seahorse hippocampus. And then was taken by the Greeks and then the so the area in front of it, it is not really part of, of the hippocampus. It's just, you know, there's a, a structure here that keeps going, rolling around and making a little tail. Uh, you know, this area is called the amygdala, which is your emotional processing center. And when the amygdala is activated, for example, if you make my information, the, the, the lesson you are presenting to me personal, um, I am going to relate more. I am going to be excited. You are, so you are going to speak about, say, um, you know, Christopher Columbus traveling, traveling and, uh, oh, can you tell me about, you know, your own self? Just maybe, was there a time where you went on a ship? And you, how about if you imagine yourself? like standing on the shore in, in Spain uh, or Portugal and and just getting onto that boat and, and just looking, you know, west. How is it going to be in the water? And make the person live the experience. That's going to be immediately once you activate the amygdala, you are going to activate the memory center, the processing center. And you can do this by role plays, by actually having uh, children uh, act out or play, you know, a certain historical scene or, or whatever. Now, we speak about memory. How does the baby start to form memory skills? In order to store the, 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 the steps of storing a new concept, the concept refers to something in the world. So in order to form a, a, a new concept, you form what is known as a schema or a schema. 
that scheme could be a verbal scheme. It could be an auditory scheme, something that you keep hearing. So when you hear it the first time, you form that kind of core image for that, that sound or that syllable or that word. And that becomes the foundation, the scheme that the first seed of that experience with that word or with that thing that you see. And then that scheme becomes connected with, you use it to interpret things that are coming in and you use it to attach things that are coming in and then you develop on it. You make it like, for example, you say type, that's a scheme. You hear it for the first time, what does type mean? And then you hear another word later says typing. Oh, now you develop your scheme. Now you, you can understand, you can take type and combine it with typing. Oh, you can say re-typing. And then you keep adding and refining the scheme and connecting it with different type, writer, And all of this now, so, but the nucleus, the original experience with that word is type. And then you expand the concept and enhance it. And then you, 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 you connect it with different things that are related to it, like computer, printer, this, that. So the first experience um, that you store is, uh, you know, visually, auditorily, or whatever is your, you, you form a scheme. And in order to form a scheme, you have to hear a word, that word you hear it the first time, so that you can own it, it becomes yours, and it becomes strong enough so that you can say it, you know, the word yourself, you hear it thousands of times before you are able to produce it. This is why the babies are hearing and hearing and hearing way 11 months they start to say the first word so the schemes that they learn early they are going they, these are going to facilitate learning of all kinds of new information as the babies develop i you, you have read the article on the 30 million word gap and basically, the, the researchers found that children who grow and they don't have enrichment, um, they hear less words. But generally, children who are developing appropriately to get enough stimulation, auditory stimulation, they should hear words, any words, repeated and all this, but interactions. And, words 42 million words or 43 million words by age three years and of course disadvantaged children who don't have that you know quality of communication that they found they only would hear the words about 13 million words so there's a big gap 30 million and of course, you know, that is going to lead to disabilities, language, cognitive, you name it. So it is really a big thing, you know, when we, we should be encouraging parents to interact with children every single minute of every single day. And, and amazingly, putting them in front of the TV, the TV doesn't teach them. They do not learn language through the TV as babies. They have to have the human interaction. So phonological memories, or you can call them phonological schemas or schematas, they are connected with semantic memories, which in, in other words, <clears throat> the sounds of a word are going to activate the meaning of that word. And the meaning of that word is going to activate the sounds of the word. <clears throat> so that is each one is going to activate the other in the, in the brain networks that store meanings and the brain networks that store sound representations and, and sound phonological memories for words. In order for someone to acquire, to build a phonological scheme or schema, they have to hear it first once, and then they have to hear it consecutively over days and over months and all for a long time they keep hearing it a certain number of times so that they can 
now integrated into their network, uh, brain networks that capture and consolidate and hold on to these phonological schemas. However, semantic schemas or the meaning of the word itself, you don't, I mean, it takes about one exposure, it takes about two exposures at most, and then you understand the meaning and you move on. And there's a period in, uh, of time during early, like uh, between about two years and, and five years or so, there's an acceleration. The baby, you know, builds the vocabulary, expands and booms. And one exposure to a meaning of a word is going to, is going to, um, to help the baby acquire that, uh, build that semantic schema. However, you notice that <clears throat> the baby is going to use a particular style. Even though, you, you know, you say chair, and they know chair. Now they have captured the meaning, but they go and point to the chair and look at you and say, and they themselves will say chair, and they want your confirmation before, so that they can now consolidate that concept and hold on to it. And then they pass through a stage where they hold something and bring it to you and name it. It's a, it's a famous stage in development. And again, that they know what it is, they say it, and then you say it back. Or sometimes they want to kind of refresh their memory of it. They bring it to you and look, and then you are supposed to name it. So that, you know, idea, exchanging things and naming them, that is to confirm the semantic schemes or schemas that they build as they internalize meaning. Again, if you are not interacting with them and engaged with them in that, they are going to fill in the meaning that they do not know. They are going to misunderstand. They will, they, they will internalize words um, incorrectly, matching them with different meanings and stuff like that. So if they have a hearing uh, loss or if they have middle ear infections, they will have a tough time now acquiring these phonological schemas and the semantic schemas that go with them. And very early in life now, you have the beginning of a communication disorder, a speech or a language um, problem. Four months of age, the child starts to now progress from a signal to a symbol. Uh, to a symbol. In other words, a bottle would serve as a signal. You know, what, what will the bottle usually, even if it's empty, the baby now takes that and associate it to say this is a signal of food, because there is food. Um, if you bring a plate or a fork, or a spoon. Now that is a signal or a symbol that is connected with the meaning of food. So the baby now is going to four months and the baby is able to see these things and make the associations, which means there's some basic memory there, but not long term yet. So that is the first step again toward acquiring language. And then, you know, of course, language gives it serves as a tool for cognition and building cognition later. By eight months, the baby now has enough memory to be able to recall what happens outside, like if they're on here and now. They are able to imagine you in the kitchen or imagine you in a different place. They have object permanence. So when the mother um, goes out of the room, the baby understands, yeah, the mother, you know, she can be somewhere else, and it doesn't mean that she has disappeared forever. Before that, you know, the, the, the mother, dis you know, goes to the next room, and the baby just cannot imagine that she will ever come back. That, you know, this is why they cry, because they don't have that memory to hold on to her image and to hold on to the living room or the other room that she might be in and then match and say, oh, she isn't here, but she may be in the next 
room but eight months then they are able how do we know um, object permanence if you are holding a toy and uh, in your hand and you just kind of playing with the baby and then you hide it behind your back you see if the baby goes like this or like that trying to look behind your back that means that they have object permanence they can imagine it now behind your back but if they do not then their memory is not strong enough now and they don't have the ability to imagine it um, they don't have the skill yet 12 months is a magical age i mean at that time the baby should take the first step of course they can take the first step before that like maybe 11 maybe some you know even 10 and a half but the average child when they reach their first birthday they should be able to take one step and they should be able to say the first word at that time at the same time they are able to understand that something causes something else causality and that enables them to understand the meaning of verbs and the and and the semantic relations you know between um, the different different words so the ability to understand causality again gives rise to the development of the ability to understand verbs and actions and the question is why don't we remember much of what happens when we were infants like up to age two years and um, the idea is that the memory centers especially in the auditory cortex they they start to connect with lower structures of the you know of the brain about two years of age so beginning two years of age then there's more like a diverse set of connections going down and then sideways horizontally and we have a, a lot of connections that will make long-term memory networks so for that reason you try to remember something that happens before age two you might the age two is is like the average you might be like say a maybe even a couple of months younger uh, but most people um, are not going to remember things that happened before age two most people can can go uh, two and a half or three um, they can tell you memories and things that that they can uh, remember at that time so long-term memory the, you know begins to the, the, the networks are connected or begin to be connected by two years of age and um, that is going now to facilitate a lot of things attention skills uh, skills will improve and memory skills of course are going to support the better language development the baby now uh, by two years is able to combine two words together to make a, like a, a prototype of a sentence and then very soon in a month or two they start to combine three and four words and they start to speak in little sentences so do you see how long-term memory facilitates so many other skills i wanted to point out here that how the auditory cortex this area of the brain here um, is organized in a way that the begin that the front part of it look detects the lowest frequencies the lowest pitches and then as you go back gradually the pitch increases and increases and increases until you reach like 20,000 hertz like the, the highest pitch will be in the back and as you go forward it will be the lowest pitch in the front so it's very very well organized we call it tonotopic organization so so that again auditory cortex <clears throat> that you had the article um, that's assigned to study the development of the auditory cortex mid childhood so about 11 to 12 years of age that structure is is built and it's connected and it's well organized and uh, given that you have to have auditory stimulation that is normal and, and sufficient in order to form memory first you have attention and i have to say that i'm speaking now about about declarative memory 
I have to say that children very early in life, they rely more on all the kinds of memory that are unconscious. But, you know, and, and, and that basically unconscious memories that we have enable us to like something and to dislike something and to basically they build our, our personality. But the kind of memory we are speaking about now is declarative, something that you ask me, I'm going to, to give you on demand. Uh, where do you live? I can, I can remember where I live, I'm going to tell you. Or tell me, explain for me the, this system or that and so on. So things that we can you know, be consciously recalling. So you need, first the person has to have um, attention skills, something that you are not paying attention to, you do not get in and internalize. And then work in memory which is the the window kind of that enables you to to sustain something hold it on the screen for a few seconds half a second for a visual and if it goes beyond half a second it just you you don't remember it and between one second i mean um, uh, one second and two seconds for a verbal kind of memory this is you, you can hold it like i give you my phone number it stays there for up to two seconds and then it's going to disappear of course unless you hear um you know that 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 you are familiar maybe with some parts or, or codes and stuff like that but if i give you a set of numbers that you are not familiar with it's going to to be uh the memory of it will decay very quickly so once you have the information comes in and it is kind of in, on that window of work and memory, then the brain is going to immediately start to rehearse that information. Keep rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing it so that it doesn't fade away. And it will be rehearsed for about two seconds. This is how long it will. And by the idea is that these neurons will be firing repeatedly, 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 nonstop for a couple of seconds, holding onto the information as long as they fire. Then in the process, the, then the person engages integrative rehearsal. They, as they rehearse, they connect with old memories that you have with your storage sites, and they will see, okay, is there anything that I know about this? So I, once there is some background about it, then you attach it to that network, and then you can now begin to internalize that memory and to take it in. Taking in new memories uh, or 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 taking in new knowledge is called encoding, encoding. Attention skills in development uh, for a baby. Um, at the beginning, at birth, they're very, very limited. And basically, they depend on external stimuli. So that, for example, you know, the baby's mother, uh, the baby will pay more attention. Uh, if it is some someone else not familiar or whatever, so very early in life, attention is is very very decreased, very limited. Then the baby actually sleeps 21 hours on average. They only have four hours, so uh, the baby will respond best if there's something that is moderate. Like if there's the light is intense, that's gonna bother them. If the light is um, is is not as you know uh, as um, you know, as good, then the, that is not going to be best. So it has to be some kind of model. If you are too loud, if you are too soft, like the gold deluxe rule, it has to be just right. At birth, in the first week or so, the baby is unable to shift attention. They be fixated on something, and they, they, they may be fixated on something, and they just have difficulty disengaging from that. Uh, selective attention emerges about near um, the eighth week or so. So eight, eight weeks after birth, the baby is going to start to kind of selectively uh, search for something and hold on to it. That's selective attention. Uh, ex the baby exhibits signs of habituation to repeated uh, stimuli. For example, um, habituation means getting used to things. For example, suppose that you somehow go to someone's house 
and that person has a washing machine that's old and when it it starts the cycle it just agitates and it just goes up and down up and making a tremendous amount of noise when you hear it the first time you get startled you are not used to it and even the second time it might startle you but gradually gradually as you continue you recognize and stuff you start your nervous system will say why should i be you know spending all this energy processing a sound that is not harmful and then you immediately kind of begin to habituate means your brain doesn't even respond to it you continue talking and that sound you are not even aware of it anymore when it stops you say oh what was that sound it happens to all of us so that is habituation so the baby um begins to be not startled by things that he or she sees over and over or by the light for example that when you put the light on you know once in a while and so on they get used to it they don't get startled or if they you speak to them and they get started once then the more you speak and you you, you know kind of um, the more that they become habituated and they do not become um, you know, they don't show the reflex of like getting startled and that now i mention here barriers one of the biggest barriers is middle ear infections middle ear infections at that time are going to cause the baby to be unable to respond to a lot of things you know um, uh, that, that the baby would hear for example and if there is earwax if there is um, you know little tiny ear canals all of this is going to cause especially if there's middle there are middle ear infections A repeated middle ear infections in childhood are going to cause bluntness they are going to cause lack of stimulation of the auditory pathways and someone who does not hear or doesn't comprehend the meaning of what you are saying they are going to go into habituation in other words you'll be speaking and speaking and they will tune you out you are not like you are not here anymore or you are not even speaking at all and their brain is like if if i switch i'm speaking now and i switch into arabic for example or french or another language that you are not familiar with and i continue speaking it takes about 20 seconds if you are healthy and everything is fine 20 seconds 25 seconds maybe and then you are going to not even hear my voice anymore the baby is like that the student in the classroom is like that if you keep talking and then they their ears are plugged or you know with earwax or with um, fluid in their ears Th that now they don't have the meaning they cannot connect with you and they are daydreaming and the sign is when they have glassy eyes as if they have like light tears in their eyes and they are just sitting there and daydreaming that's a big sign of middle ear infections and if they have their mouth opened like this and they are breathing through the mouth that means that so the idea is that uh, situations like uh, when the baby the child uh, you know young child for example is, is in a preschool or a or or, a, or a elementary or in a school um, and and they they breathe through the mouth and their eyes are kind of glassy and that means multiple symptoms number one that the child likely has middle ear infections like water in the flu uh, in the ears um, that the child might have enlarged adenoid and this is why when we breathe we normally close our mouths breathe through our nose but here you have the soft palate that you know separates the oral cavity from the nasal cavity and this is the back of the throat you are supposed to to leave this open so that as you are um, breathing the air comes in and goes down to the, the the pharynx so it goes through the airway 
but when you have now the adenoids i'm looking for something that will mimic them the adenoids will be bulging out of the pharyngeal wall and they will narrow the airway as a, as a result the ba the child is looking you know trying to get oxygen and they can't so they breathe through their mouths in severe cases in severe cases the adenoids can be as large as a golf ball in severe cases i mean that that is so anyways and again in 66 percent of the cases when there's adenoid enlargement there's also tonsil enlargement we call them the palatine tonsils the ones in the mouth because these two are connected together so all of this is going to produce um, like if they have adenoid enlargement that means that the child is going to snore uh, during sleep and you can simply ask the parent does your child snore if you see these symptoms and if they do then that's a red flag it means you have to refer to the ear nose and, and throat um, uh, doctor and they will do the, the diagnosis and but be, if they decide on surgery the age of the child matters and also they are going to do a sleep study first and in the cases I have seen myself as a speech language pathologist, um, in, in almost every case I referred, the sleep study came showing that the individual is losing more than 30% of their sleep time. Because you know what? They have sleep apnea. They you know, sleep and then the breathing is interrupted and then they wake up every two minutes and they end up losing so much sleep they have no energy in the day they they are sleepy in the day they have no attention at all and memory don't even talk about memory and all of these problems they are facing um, we need to be aware of so these are big barriers middle ear infections and large adenoids the early signs of intelligence intelligence I mean, all of you are educators and clinical practitioners. You, you know, you, you know now that we are moving away from the classical definitions of intelligence as something that you are born with. It's an ability, it's a talent, it's a gift. No. What science is showing now is that intelligence is something that you build, that you develop. You have the readiness for it initially when you are born. Your brain comes, you know, ready but it depends on what kind of stimulation that you get, how extensive your stimulation through your sensory experiences, how much enrichment we have in your environment. And that is going to build your intelligence. So the idea that intelligence is fixed is wrong and it is false. Intelligence is tested. Look at what it is tested. You test their language. Can you build and develop language? Yes, you can. Can you develop the uh, different uh, skills that you test, you know, sorting or memory? Yes, you can. So all of the, 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 the looking, we need to look from a growth mindset at intelligence so that we understand it is something that is developed with experience and with exposure, with knowledge and all of this. So <clears throat> the earliest signs of intelligence um, are visible clearly by age two and these are the skills that the child exhibits so you can see that they have um, you know they are developing normally first the child develops symbolic thought for example they might take you know you know their fingers and put two dots and a smile oh this is a person and they start, you know, for example, to play with this and, oh, I am a firefighter or I'm a police officer and this and that. And they speak, you know, with that person. So that is symbolic play because, you know, you, you take an object or something and you make it stand for something and make it a symbol for something else. The, ba the, the child um, is able to, to problem solve physical problems, for example they want to reach um the, the you know there's a, a jar of cookies somewhere and they would like to reach for it they might go drag a chair and put it next to the counter and climb on the chair 
um, or they want to go to you know do something and there's an obstacle in the way they either go under or go around so and of course babies can do this even earlier um, also they are able to comprehend action oriented cognitive schemes they can they can actually have a plan and carry it out and for example um, when they want to do a certain uh, they play a certain game they might take something out and put something you know else inside of a container uh, or might take things and organize them in a certain way they have s steps that they follow to do a certain task imitation is a big part of language I mean, big part of cognition, big part of development, uh, motor uh, development, um, and, and all aspect, aspects of development. Uh, there are what is known as motor neurons. Um, a set of motor neurons are called mirror neurons. So these motor neurons <coughs> are specialized in basically mirroring what someone else does, and they're a big part of the, the motor system. So we can kind of imitate the movements and imitate the facial expressions and, and, and things that we see motorically. Imitation emerges very early in, in you know, for example, as you can see in the image here, uh, uh, three, four, five, even even three months old <clears throat> is able to imitate the tone of your voice when you make like say speak to them and, and play games. You open your mouth, they open their mouths, they, they mimic your movements. And you can, uh, mothers uh, usually play an interesting game with the babies when they m mimic what the baby does and then the baby reacts more and you engage um, the baby shows pleasure by verbal kind of making noises and all of this um, in response to your <coughs> attempts and of course they will mimic your, your uh, facial movements uh, facial uh, yeah movements. so the baby first they you know start to imitate themselves by saying something or doing something and do it again so to reproduce the same thing consistently and then by about eight months consistently they are able now to imitate others um, nine months imitation becomes a tool for learning for example they might use it you know to imitate facial expressions to show um, you know angry or joking and so on motor movements and also sounds so they start to rely on this is a major tool to build build their uh, skills we come back to the development of cause and effect previously i mentioned that by 12 months of age the child should be able to to, to have uh, causality um, uh, basically uh, you know significant understanding that something causes an action but the skill itself starts to to emerge about eight months of age the baby is able to understand for example that uh, you know someone's goal <clears throat> and they will be able to anticipate what that goal is simply by looking at one piece either a cause and they can predict predict the effect or looking at an effect and they can predict the cause for example when they see the mother um, you know wear, beginning to wear a coat they start to cry why because they understand that wearing the coat means she will be going out so that is a you know you know cause and effect and they will be crying as a result uh, nine months the baby is able to establish his or her own goals now they can select ways to reach that goal like if there are some if there's some like say an apple on the counter and the baby wants to get it 
the baby might try to climb on a chair or or maybe go around you know something so that they try to reach it uh, able to anticipate events that are out of here and now why because eight months they are able that they have uh, object permanence man that you can't have this if you can't imagine another place outside of where you are and you can imagine then another time so so these are huge huge leaps in development um <clears throat> the ability to understand cause and effect again is essential for developing problem solving and also for developing how objects are represented in the brain especially in relation to verbs and the effect of the actions associated with verbs play is very important in the life of a child play that babies have readiness by nature like animals look at animals watch all kinds of baby animals play is part of building their life skills in a relaxed way in a safe environment like animals climb on each other pull at the you know ears of each other and then go sometimes rough play because they are preparing for the real thing in the world when they actually go and and you know do the the skills that they can do babies um, rely on play to develop their emotional abilities motor abilities cognitive abilities and it, it play is critical for building language because it has a context and they are exposed to language in a safe environment in an enjoyable environment that will increase the production of certain chemicals like oxytocin that will make the the baby's not you know physical growth better and the baby uses oxytocin to connect and bond with others and use it as a way to store positive experiences, social experiences. And uh, also, play reduces stress hormones. So you have the, you know, the equation for creating an optimal environment for learning, play. And a kind of play is symbolic play. Like I said, you know, going and, and pretending, uh, pretend play, that this is say a police officer and this is you know this and that and you have them talk or or you get a a, a, a game that has like a you know, a train or a station you know, and stuff like gas station and so on all of this is symbolic play one of the core the foundational um, components of autism is absence of symbolic play that they you know research shows that they don't have well-developed symbolic play they can't just pretend and um, and as a result the field of play uh, is is quite big you know whether it's speech language pathology or related fields the field of play teaching children how to play and how to negotiate and interact it is critical for social communication development uh, for the development of numerous, numerous cognitive skills. So there's a direct correlation between symbolic play and language development. As, as, as I mentioned, people with autism um, generally, generally have, do, not, do not have well-developed play skills. And as a result, all of this wave in kind of teaching um, play skills it, it means since if you do, I mean you don't have the chance to develop it we can teach it and of course it, it is effective but it depends on what model and what you know kind of approach you are using theory of mind is a skill that it means social perspective taking it means being in someone else's shoes theory of mind means it is not a theory that you want that that wants to be that you want to uh, prove or, or or investigate it, it basically 
it is the ability to develop a theory, an idea about how someone else thinks. So the ability to know or knowing uh, and keeping in mind that other people have thoughts and they have beliefs and feelings exactly just like you do. And that their feelings and thoughts and beliefs and all of this are as important and as real to them as your own feelings and thoughts are important and real to you. So it is, you know, equality. I am a person, you are a person. Uh, you have feelings, I have feelings. But you might, uh, for example, be upset because of something that doesn't upset me. So you come to the next step is that these feelings and emotions and beliefs, they do not have to be the same as mine because you are a different person. So these feelings and beliefs and, and all of this do, you know, they, they do not have to be the same like, like my own. So knowing that is going to enable you to build an automatic process that enables you to infer things as you speak with someone from a word they say, you understand, oh, they do not like this. Or from a word that they say, oh, they are, like, are going to like that. So that is going to enable you to detect what they do not like, what they like, what they don't care about. And as you communicate with them, you are going to selectively choose things that do not, um, that, that do not disagree with them things that will will not cause you know unless someone does it intentionally of course and in that case they have to also understand have that theory of mind you know what makes that person upset and then they go after and agitate and they achieve their goal so uh having theory of mind enables us to infer people's intentions and desires and emotions and knowledge and feelings and beliefs it enable if you do that if you are able to infer that you are going now to be able to predict predict their actions. For example, you know someone is scared of spiders, and then you are you, you are sitting at a table, and then you just get a plastic spider. You know when you put it in front of them, they're gonna freak out. So now you predicted their thoughts. You you knew you know, and then also predicted their behavior. And um, so it's a, it's a big, big thing. And, and again, people with autism have, a, have a, an underdeveloped theory of mind. But how does theory of mind develop? Before I explain this, theory of mind, it has to do with the reciprocity. Like I said, I am a person, you are a person. And I have to build a theory about your brain. How do you relate to what I'm going to say or do? how much knowledge you have about a particular topic. If I do not have a good theory of mind, developed theory of mind, I might be telling something that you already know or something that you that is way above your head. So, it, you know, I have, based on my understanding of your cognitive processes, I am going to choose the best thing that will enable me to achieve my communication goal um, because I'm going to be able to infer your intentions and thoughts and also predict your actions so in a way i can you know create cooperativeness or the opposite if i choose to you know if someone is manipulative they with their theory of mind understanding they can really give the other person you know tough time um theory of mind first in order to build it, the child has to have self-awareness. They have to look in the mirror, recognize the person they are looking at is, is themselves. That is about five, five months, six months. And then around 18 months, they recognize, um, for example, themselves as a person, as a, as a person who has his own thoughts and processes that are different than someone else's. Yeah, and then about two months of age, they are able to express their own emotional states, angry happy and so on and they are also able to pretend things at that time if the baby uh, the toddler is walking around telling you something and you don't understand it they look for signs they might raise their voice 
they might, if you are reading a book and they are not looking at them, they might go and grab the book out of your um, hand or move it away and look at you because they can see, they can infer that your brain is not focused on on them, on what they are saying. So that is theory of mind. They can imagine how you are or that you don't understand them. So they, um, they imagine what is in your mind and then they find solutions for that, whether by repeating a word or saying it in a different way. By age four, they are masters. They now transition to the ability to read um, other people's minds. And they basically, it's almost sim similar to adults. But from this point, they refine it as they grow. The idea is this, <clears throat> uh, as you watch the, the video, there are false belief stories that are used to, to, to test or to develop theory of mind. The simplest form basically um, the simplest form of this is having a container. So when you look at this and say, oh, what do you think there is here? Well, they say, well, there is a, of course, you are going to say toothpaste. But what if um, now I'm going to show you what's in the container. So here I have some hand lotion. So now I'm going to say to you, to the child, um, Max isn't here and or any other person. Max is not here at the moment. But if I have this and show him this when he comes in, what do you think there will be in this box? If the baby says, uh, Max is going to think there is a, a, a bottle of lotion in there. It means that the baby or the child, because the child knows what is in here, he is going to think that everyone in the world is, is also going to know what is in there. So, But the child should say, I is going to think that there is toothpaste. Why? Because the, the box is a toothpaste box. So, and you see in the video, so that is a skill that is, um, again, critical for the development um, of individuals in life. And you can see in some adults, they wouldn't even have a theory of mind that is well developed. And that causes tremendous problems at work and in and, and, and the family and all of this. Uh, this is the primary source that this information came from. I mixed it with some neurology from different sources, but that if you want, and you can access Robert Owen's um, language development and introduction, and you are going to find a chapter dedicated to the development of cognitive skills, perceptual motor, and, and early language skills. And um, it is a robust and well-researched uh, source. So sorry for the video, um, you know, being so long, but you can pause it and, and, you know, for every maybe 30 minutes and come back to it. So thank you. And um, we'll, uh, next, next time we're going to speak about brain connectivity and how experience determines brain connectivity. Thank you.